Well, that took a lot longer than expected. I actually had to build the whole thing twice, because uh, I had it completely built up once, and then I was unhappy with the accuracy I was getting on some of the granite pieces. So I made all of them from scratch again, and now here we are. It's not finished yet, but it is working. So let's take a look through um, and look at all the major components, top lessons learned, uh, and start from the bottom and go up. I was originally going to build my own leveling feet, but I found these integrated ratcheting uh, casters with leveling feet, and it just saved so much trouble. So I went with them instead. If you think you might be able to get away with just locking casters, think again. This early motion test doesn't even have the full weight of the spindle and uh, Z-axis on there, and it's already flopping around like crazy. Power and air come down to nice bulkhead connections on the side. I didn't really have space below the uh, internal baffles to get the 220 plug on there, uh, but just the cable will uh, do for now. E-stop kills power to the VFD and the servo power supply, and that's just uh, tucked away on the side on the front of the machine where it's easy to get to. The computer and monitor are all attached to a monitor arm, uh, so it can really easily move out of the way and uh, get around the door. The computer doesn't need to be here mounted to the front, but uh, since I don't have anything else to put there, it makes it convenient to get to the power button and the uh, USB connectors on the front. The buttons to control the tool changer uh, are also here. The wiring in the back is a bit of a mess, but the whole thing's gotta change eventually anyway, because the arm is really not uh, sturdy enough to hold this much weight. Uh, so that's all gonna have to change out in the future. Right angle plugs for all of the data connections and off the back of the computer and make the wiring really uh, tidy on the side. And I opt to keep all of the USB devices here at the computer side and run uh, the Modbus serial uh, all the way back to the uh, cabinet because I'm counting on that uh, signal being a little more robust than uh, consumer USB. A quick bodge on the monitor arm because it doesn't like having the weight really unevenly distributed side to side. So this little scrap of aluminum here with a bolt lets you tighten against the front of it to prevent it from spinning. And that just fastens through to existing holes in the uh, flange that hold that uh, rotating mount in the first place. Uh, quick and really effective. The control cabinet's in the back uh, where the lower drawers have been removed. The front's dominated by the coolant reservoir and the chiller for the spindle. Um, the coolant I'm running is just uh, plain water with uh, water wetter. Uh, the chiller is the smallest like aquarium style chiller that I could find. Um, its case is too big to fit in this space, so that's removed and the whole thing is run bare. It's not ideal, but it does make it fit. With the cooling loop pulled out of the way, you can get a better look at uh, the rest of the electronics. Everything is still mounted to a wooden board that I use to do like pre-layout uh, and test it outside of the cabinet. So now that the build is settled in, I need to go back through and um, pull these off the board and mount them directly to the uh, steel uh, backing of the uh, cabinet, like I've started to do with the air pressure regulators and the uh, solenoids at the top. 110 power comes into the uh, terminal blocks there on the left and feeds the low voltage power supplies uh, 5, 12, and 24 volts up on the DIN rail on the top. On the right side is the 70 volt power supply for the servos and the power distribution board. For the e-stop circuit, I'm using a three-phase contactor. Um, the 110 that drives the servo power supply is on the first contact, and then the second two contacts have the split phase 220 uh, to power that Hitachi VFD. I keep it on a separate 110 uh, rather than using half of the split phase just so that I can have it plugged into only 110 for testing to be able to move the servos around and stuff like that uh, without having to uh, be near the 220 plug. On the right side of the cabinet, I've got the low voltage and control, so the UC300 sits in the middle. Low voltage uh, power distribution on the DIN rail in the bottom, uh, as well as the braking resistor for the VFD, just because there's no place uh, for it uh, on the opposite side of the cabinet. All the sensor lines and the uh, blue servo cables are not chopped down to length yet uh, until everything is absolutely settled where it's going to go because that's just far too much trouble to uh, try to extend later. For pneumatics, I'm using all the same solenoid uh, just to make it easy uh, for the mounting. So even on like the air blast where it's just uh, on off versus the uh, tool changer, which has a vent on it. They're all bolted straight through each other to a uh, plate on the side, which uh, clips into the DIN rail. And then I've got them buffered behind uh, smaller relays just in case I need to drive them from something uh, even lower powered in the future. 
And then all the different regulators for the uh, spindle case pressure, the uh, tool changer clean out and ejection, and the uh, air blast run across the back. They're fed from a small air filter and water separator um, on the off screen to the left uh, that pulls from the bulkhead connector. And another little bit of temporary bit there, this PCV tucked down in the bottom is the multi-input board that I made for the tool setter and touch probe and contact probe. Uh, so it deals with both normally open and normally closed contacts um, and merges them all into a, a single input. So now I'm gonna redesign the electronics in my touch probe to be 24 volt tolerant. Um, and so this whole thing will need to be redesigned for that as well uh, and give it a better form factor so it can actually mount to something. When slotting the granite, I found it easiest to cut a bunch of thin uh, wedges like this and not to worry about um, actually a finish clean cut all the way on the bottom because um, these slices are then really easy to just knock out with a hammer and it saves a ton of cutting time. Here's what it looks like when you actually go back through with the tile saw and slide that blade uh, back and forth to get a, a cleaner flat bottom onto it uh, although I found that it didn't really it's not necessary for uh, clearance with the ball screw for the most part um, so for the final pieces I didn't actually do that Cutting the pockets for the ball screw mount plates uh, works a similar way. Rather than uh, trying to grind everything out going in with a diamond hole saw and cutting every half diameter leaves you with uh, nice little chunks that are really easy to just whack with a hammer and they pop off almost a perfectly clean bottom. Here's how the glue up for the ball screw mounts uh, looked. The one, two, three blocks are in place to give a uh, rough level on the screw uh, threads itself. Then the mount plate is bolted to the mount and suspended uh, with the epoxy in the set. The height is set on either side by a pair of adjustable parallels that are all set to be exactly the same height. And then the whole thing is tied up with uh, stainless steel safety wire to keep it supported while it sets up. For mounting the column in the gantry, um, I just laminated uh, flat blocks of steel uh, with the whole patterns drilled into them because that was far easier to prep than drilling pockets uh, and, and setting the plates down inside the surface plate. This plate for the base of the machine, I've got an extra set of screw holes so I can adjust the, uh, the gantry forward and backwards by a couple of inches to compensate uh, for uh, different stick outs on the uh, spindle off the z-axis. The uh, very large 120 millimeter spindles come forward a lot more than the little 80 millimeter um, ISO 10 spindle that I started with. So this lets me push things uh, without having to uh, you know, rebuild the entire thing. So here it is with most of the linear components uh, blocked into place, but without a lot of the uh, other stuff covering them up. The granite plate itself sits on a, uh, a square of uh, steel tubing that's welded together um, and then uh, welded to the top of the tool cabinet. The outer square is just the size, uh, the outer edge of the plate itself, and uh, the crossbars are set to roughly uh, give me a place under the airy points on the front and back. Uh, to mount the plate. The center spine is just kind of an extra thing I threw in there with uh, some scrap pieces. So that middle section um, is cross braced over the, uh, the much stiffer spine uh, where the two uh, tool cabinets are uh, welded together. They've got that um, extra thick shell down in the middle. Uh, so hopefully give it a little more support uh, than having the, the really long span of uh, tubing edge to edge with nothing really to hold it up. To hold the plate, I used the mounting feet that I originally got to use to hold the tool cabinet down and turned them upside down. They're roughly in the airy points, although I moved the, uh, the ones in the back a little further out since it's not just a plate with nothing on it. I've got a lot of extra weight on that gantry, so I wanted uh, the mount points on the rear to be a little more underneath the gantry so that that extra weight was supported and it was less likely to flop around. Here we're looking in from the side on the Y-axis. I've got a small cast iron plate there that you can see just above the trucks that's bolted to the trucks and the ball screw and that has a simple bolt pattern that bolts to the larger aluminum fixture plate up on top. Um, the thing at the front uh, holds the way covers because they're mounted to the cast iron plate on the bottom uh, instead of the fixture plate up top so that can be really easily uh, removed or swapped out for other fixture plates as needed. 
This is what that y-axis cover looks from the uh, front. You can see that front guard actually sticks quite a bit beyond the front of the plate to give the uh, cover room to clap so I get as much y-axis travel as possible. While I don't have a true datum edge to clamp the rails against, I did find it incredibly useful to make these little steel pucks uh, and gently lap uh, one edge of them flat. And then these are epoxied onto the surface of the granite to give a reference edge um, for the first rail to go in. So I don't have to constantly find and refine um, the level across uh, when setting up the axis. I can set that once the uh, reference plates are uh, epoxied in place. And then when I set that first rail in place, it's really easy to get all of the other components lined up with that rail and uh, not have to go back and forth over it. On the bottom of my temporary z-axis I've got a little steel plate so I can use mag holders uh, for indicators and then up here at the top I've got uh, the bracket that holds the uh, gas shock which happens here to be mounted upside down and this is just a little wider look at the uh, full gantry and the great thing about building on toolbox is all my tooling fits inside the cart I made these little MDF holders to keep them from uh, rolling around and so they can all stay numbered in their position. I don't have any room for tool racks on the front of the machine because I'm using hinge doors instead of uh, sliders um, and the entire outside is, is pretty narrow so there isn't anywhere on the face to put them but down inside in the cabinet. The entire enclosure is just made with uh, wood and Lexan windows. Here's a little in progress from when uh, it was initially being put together. Remember when I did this test with my original 3040, pushing lightly with my pinky able to move the spindle about uh, one thou, and uh, pushing much harder with my uh, thumb, almost eight thou worth of uh, movement on the new machine, light pinky push, maybe a couple of tenths, not even uh, half a thou, and then pushing really hard with my thumb, uh, getting up to about one thou deflection. For kicks, I also did it in reverse because uh, this direction is fixed and, and not pushing against the ball screw. And uh, it felt uh, even stiffer, about a half thou deflection uh, instead of one thou when I'm pushing from the front uh, with that thumb. Of course, what really matters is how it cuts. So here, let's take a look at the first uh, test cut that I did uh, with a quarter inch on screwed uh, O-flute end mill in 6061. Still a really conservative cut, um, but the chips look okay. And uh, honestly, I'm really happy with the finish considering it's not even trammed in yet. And this is literally the first test cut uh, done on the machine. So here on the left is one of the last cuts I did on my old 3040. And on the right is the test piece that I just cut. So I'm incredibly happy with this results considering I haven't even uh, started to dial it in yet. So we're already doing way better on aluminum. Does this mean that we have enough headroom to actually do steel? Here I'm cutting with a AL10 coated two flute quarter inch end mill. The color of the chips was looking good, but I'd obviously damaged the uh, end, the tip of the end mill. I was getting a lot of heat at the very tip of the chips. So I swapped back to the uh, next largest uh, end mill that I had, which was a little smaller.
The chips come out generally a nice looking straw color and they're a decent size. They're not totally, totally uh, spindly. The finish isn't amazing. You can see a lot of chatter around, um, but I would probably rate this in steel about as good as my uh, 3040 was doing in aluminum. Uh, so I'm really happy with that step up. Of course, as I mentioned, this is not actually finished. So I have, for instance, here are the parts for the uh, uh, new Z-axis, uh, which is all made out of steel uh, and the covers for the X and Z uh, as well and new uh, uprights, as well as having to finish all of the additional sensors for the, the spindle uh, the coolant flow sensor and the temperature, the spindle temperature sensors and all of that stuff. I've got uh, Modbus data acquisition uh, box to hook up. But things are finally in a good state with it. I'm really happy with how it's turned out. Uh, and I'll probably do a follow-up at some point once I get this stuff all sorted out. But I'm finally in a good spot to uh, start getting back to uh, my norm, more normal postings, uh, looking at some, uh, all the motor tests that I've had sitting around for the last year and uh, some more data analysis stuff.